Europe's far north, a journey into Scandinavia's unending expanses, people and their stories. Svealand, the historic core of Sweden, is the land of the Elks. More than 400,000 live hidden in the wilderness. Helge is an elk with a human mind. A cartoonist has given him the breath of life. The hunt for herring, the smelly surströmming is being made on the island of Ulvu. For some, a delicacy. Falu red from the copper mine. The whole country uses falo paint from Dalana. Inebriation in the birch forest. Once mocked today, he produces birch wine for the whole world. Sweden, far up towards the Norwegian border, 150 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. This can be seen quite clearly. Kipnekeza, at 2,100 meters, the highest mountain in Sweden. On a clear day, one can see an 11th of the country from its southern summit. That's what they say anyway. It's a mere 500 kilometers south of the province of Lapland. She is not running that far, but she runs daily and strenuously. And some Hayton. Solitude is the home of Heidi Andersen, an eight times world champion. I started 18 years ago. In those days, they showed arm wrestling on TV. The Swedish championships, very interesting. Papa and his brothers drove to the championships and copied it. First, we did it at the kitchen table. Not as a sport, just as farming people, at normal tables. I've always been fascinated by athletics and martial arts. Who's stronger? Woman against woman, man against man. And this is what Heidi tests daily. Apart from the grandmas and the mothers, all here have the same passion, arm wrestling. When the clan comes together, then there are just 16 people. That is the whole village of Ensamhaten. <laughs> this is probably why Heidi collects world champion titles like others collect stamps. From childhood she had to compete with men. especially with Papa. Papa is good. We often sparred together. But my favorite opponents are the Russians in my weight class of under 65 kilograms. They're usually called Irina or Olga. In the last 18 years, I have got through quite a few Olgas and Irinas. <laughs> It was always something positive to be strong here. When I was small and could, for example, carry many logs, then there was admiration. They said, how strong you are. Heidi lives with her husband, biathlon Olympic medalist Björn Ferry, 10 kilometers away from Ensamhaten in town. When she visits her parents at home, she mucks in. Bringing in the hay during the short summer, easy peasy. The main thing is to be together. The closeness has shaped her. 
No matter what I do with my life, Ensam Hayton will always be there. Ensam Hayton is not just a place, it's the people that count. There's always something going on here. But there is also security and harmony. Now I come here to recharge my batteries. Although it's not a particularly quiet place, and some Hayton is full of energy. Another reason to come home, the strawberries are ripe. Even though they live in a remote area, the Andersons are not solitary people. We've put up arm wrestling tables in all the schools in the area. My father and uncle are employed as supporters to work with difficult children. It seems as if the children get rid of superfluous energy at these tables. They don't fight or argue, but establish their pecking order through arm wrestling. That is a fantastically positive effect. The therapeutic effect is a minor matter. Thanks to the Andersons' laborers, there is a high-performance arm wrestling center in the Storuman district, which is constantly producing new champions. Heidi's international success is contagious. I arm wrestle not just for the title, there's more. It's difficult to describe. You have to experience it. This explosion of adrenaline when you're standing there, the focusing, when you're arm wrestling, there is only the here and now. The moment, the second, ready, go. She has been training every day for 16 years. In addition, there are competitions and TV appearances. Everybody in Sweden now knows the strong girl from the solitude. My aim is to become the oldest female arm wrestler in the world. The oldest so far was a Brazilian. She was 83. The Baltic coast in southern Lapland. Its landmark, the Höger Kustenbrunn, one of the world's longest suspension bridges. The Höger Kusten, the high coast, now free from the weight of glaciers, is rising 8 millimeters a year. The biggest documented land uplift in the world. Some people never let go of Höger Kusten because they have fallen head over heels in love. Some even fall in love with a fish, the Surströmming, fermented herring, a really special delicacy that can only be found on the rugged Höger Kusten and in northern Sweden. The harbour of the island Ulvö. This is where Ruben Martsen lost his heart when he came over from Norway 20 years ago. I bought myself a boat and was sailing from bay to bay, searching for a house. Then I came to Ulvö, and with a bit of luck, I managed to buy a house. Well, it was a real lucky streak after all. I've been living here now since 1993. Everybody was always talking about Sir Strömming, but nobody was looking after it. It was on its way to extinction. So I thought I would fish for myself and make my own. The sea guided me here, and the Sustrimming became my passion, my favorite story. Sustrimming 
Sulsturming can only be made using freshly caught young herring. Suerströmming from Ulvö splits the Swedish nation into lovers and haters. No matter how you view it, its smell and taste certainly make it unique. Ruben Mason knows nothing better. Certainly, this is what he never ceases to claim. When you work with the surströmming, you take what you need from nature. You're outside in nature, and you get your food from nature. First, there is the experience of being on the sea, and then you come home and use natural processes to transform this small fish, which is worth little more than a grape, to something more valuable. With the help of nature, you create this heavenly taste. You have to use your nose, eyes, fingers and sense of taste. It's an unbelievable way of life. Suerströming has a long tradition in northern Sweden. Since medieval times, the fish has been preserved in brine to make it keep as a cheap everyday meal. It has been available in tins for 150 years. The basic process is the same everywhere. The full-grown Baltic herring is first gutted and cleaned, then it is left to ferment in barrels for a set amount of time before it is tinned. Steadily fermenting its way to consumption. After eight weeks, we remove the herring from the barrels. They've finished fermenting. We pack the surströmming into tins, plated like this. So it looks nice, because by now it's become a delicacy. Finally, you open the tin and experience something like a culinary nirvana. There are supposed to be people in Sweden who would not agree with Ruben. Ruben doesn't care yet. Some surpluses even claim that Suerströmming is no more than rotten fish, totally inedible, really horrible. They call it stinky fish and ignore the historical dimension of the dish and the subtle nuances in the flavors of the different kinds. Pitiful, says Ruben, but never mind. Today there is the test meal with friends. Kära vänner, till bords. I have a lot of respect for this dish. I love it. It's also called food, something you need to survive. I consider the surströmming so unique, alive, so different, that I decided to dedicate my life to this passion. Elangård, 
There is a certain justifiable shyness in getting close to the Surströmming. In Sweden, its consumption is considered a test of courage. The smell is, well, intense. <laughs> and transporting tins of Surströmming on flights by Air France and British Airways is strictly forbidden. Not because of the smell, but because of the risk of explosion. Around 400,000 elks live in Sweden's forests and marshes. But where? One has to be very lucky to see one of the shy giant deer. Sweden has the largest number of elk in Northern Europe. In autumn, during the hunting season, up to a quarter of the population are shot. Elks are friendly animals, but they're a traffic hazard and create a lot of damage in forestry plantations. At least, this is what the hunters, car drivers and forest owners say. Orphaned calves often remain they find a new home with Sune Hegmark. It all started with a telephone call from a hunter. I was the director of social services and was looking for a hobby. I thought I could raise those two elks, then release them back into the woods. But they kept on coming back. So I had to keep them. That was 15 years ago. The elks have become Suna's life's work. He looks after orphans and sick animals. Come da, Lena. At the moment we have two sets of twins, two brothers and two small cows. They were born in the enclosure, but in one week we'll take them out to tame them. Otherwise they get too wild. They get elk milk and twigs, get used to humans and then it's back to their mothers. Luckily, elks have become a business for Sune. Each day he guides visitors through his elk garden near Östersund. There are more than 30 such parks throughout Sweden. You can get very close to the animals here. Presumably because Suna has learned to speak elk, from a simple greeting to the mating call. The contact call. This is how they speak to each other. This is a mating call. They do this for five weeks continuously. Elk are majestic animals. 
They remind me of elephants. They're big, but very friendly. And also very shy. I marvel at all their attributes. When they came to me and became tame, it was a bit like falling in love with a woman. I couldn't let them go again. Sweden, land of the elks, the forests and lakes. It is lonely in Fulufjellet National Park. Deep in the forest here lives another elk friend, Lars Mortimer. He is the father of the comic book hero Helge and spends most of his time doing what he enjoys most in his solitude, drawing. His character. His character. He's a slightly melancholic and often depressed elk. That's understandable if you're hunted every year and live in a cold climate with little to eat. One could say circumstance has made him melancholic. Lars says that Helga was born on the back seat of a Volvo, figuratively. Suddenly he had the idea of putting the wild animal on two legs and giving him human traits. The forest and people. It's about a thinly populated area. A lot of room between the houses and a lot of space between people. A certain mentality develops then. I know it quite well. And you can use it, make it humorous. Helga, the two-legged elk, has been wowing Swedish newspaper readers for a long time. His adventures are also regularly published in anthologies. So there's a constant demand for more. Lars Mortimer's calculation is easy. One strip per day. One week has six working days and he delivers every five weeks. That makes 30 small comics per delivery. He has plenty of ideas. You meet people, you listen. Sometimes it happens whilst you're reading. It comes from everywhere. Or from being alone, sitting alone. Lots of ways. Helge doesn't have it easy. He is constantly on the run disadvantaged by nature, taunted, belittled. What a life! But Lars Mortimer has deep affection for his creation. He's been with me for so long. I've got used to him, so to speak. But of course, sometimes I take a holiday and then he's a long way away. But he comes back goes away and comes back. It's been like this for 19, 20 years. We know each other quite well. In the middle of Dalana province, a meteorite has left its traces. 
370 million years and a few ice ages have passed since then, but Lake Silyan's shape still shows a visible sign of the impact. A little further south, the houses get redder. The crater in the center of the town of Falun is much smaller and considerably younger than Celia. Around 350 years ago, a mine collapsed here and a huge hole was created. Nobody was heard because it was midsummer and all the miners were off duty. That's the story. A waste product of the Falun mine is still very popular today. Falu Red, the famous Falu Rödfög. If you ask children in Sweden to draw a house, they would draw a red one with white corners. That is what a Swedish house looks like. The wooden houses in the old workers' quarters are also red. Together with the mines, they are designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and recall for Loon's copper mining heyday. Johanna is a mining engineer. Although the last pit here closed in 1992, she cannot complain about lack of work. She keeps history alive. The mine was in use for 1,300 years. It was opened at some point at the end of the 7th century. We don't know exactly when. Archaeological dating tells us that the mine must have existed as far back as that, though. According to legend, there was a billy goat called Kore who grazed here. When he was grubbing around, his horns got red patches. So the red color in the mine played a role from the start, if you can believe the old stories. In the 17th century, two-thirds of the world's copper production came from Falun's shafts. Working conditions underground were never comfortable. In those days, the miners also had to be acrobats to get to the deeper shafts. They used the conveying cages as elevators. Six or seven pitmen stood on the edge of the cage and went down. The cages didn't stop. If they wanted to get out, they had to rock the cage to get close to the edge and jump off. You didn't want to miss because the shaft is 280 meters deep. From here, it's still 150 meters to the bottom. And it's a relief to get back to daylight. The ore from Falun only contained 3 to 4 percent copper. The slag isn't worthless, however. You can extract Falu red from it, the sought after red paint. The rocks of the mine have been subjected to the elements for centuries. Sun, wind, water, heat, and cold are weathering it and what remains is the red dust needed for the production of original Falu red. The people in the paint factory don't rest, sieving, washing, drying and finally baking until the desired result is there. One can only tell if the paint sample has the right nuance by eye. A machine can't do that. Only the workers who put in the pestle and say, now the color is ready. 
There can be differences because every burn is different. Real fallow red conserves wood and is as modern today as it was 500 years ago. We are proud that all of Sweden is painted with this color. I think it's important to know that the material or this paint has been extracted from here for such a long time. We are part of a living cultural heritage, working here and keeping production going. Only 13 kilometers from Falun is Sunborn, a small town on Lake Tofta in the middle of Dalana. Here in the heart of Sweyerland stands the architecturally conspicuous house of painter Karl Larsen. From outside it looks more like it should be on an alpine meadow. But no Swedish house could be more Swedish. A place of pilgrimage for Sweden fans from around the world. Up to six groups are shown through the narrow rooms at the same time. They come from the home decor and the pictures with which Carl Larsen made his family and Alana famous. In the late 19th century, Karl Larsson was given a house in Sundborn by his parents-in-law. It became the joint art project for Karl and his wife Karin. They refurbished it again and again and created a home for themselves and their seven children that was to become seminal for Swedish design. Lilla Hittnes is still owned by the family. The Larsson's grandchildren Dijker, 86, Loki, 88, and Lasse, 80 years old, are often here, in their childhood home. That's my father. Yes, that's your father, Esbjörn. How old is he there? Six? Yes, he's six years old. He looks a bit grumpy there. Looks like it, yes. Didn't enjoy standing still. They were sitting here. Carl Larsson up here, Granddad and Grandma sat here, and then all the children. Espion, Kerstin, Britta, Lisbeth, Pontus, Ulf, Susanna. That's funny, they were sitting sorted by age. Karl and Karin Larsson designed furniture, lamps, materials and decorated the house in a way not seen before. This was the origin of what has become Scandinavian interior decoration. The famous Swedish furniture store, with four letters, got a lot of inspiration from here. It's nice to have it like this, to lie back comfortably after dinner. Hence the name, Lazy Corner. When we were growing up, we didn't understand that this was so special. It was not remarkable for us, absolutely not. 
Nej. <laughs> Men han, var, han var faktiskt inte så populär då. He wasn't so popular then in Sweden. But he was in Germany. When we went to school, people weren't talking about Karl Larsson so much. Karl Larsson was a genius of self-promotion. His wife and children, the neighbors, even the dog modeled for him. And visitors were never turned away but shown around for a fee. Then, as now. Lilla Hitnes in Dalarna, a truly living museum. What is typically Swedish? Red houses, elks, forests, lakes. And wasn't there something else? Birch trees. The sap of the birch is a folk medicine that eases complaints such as gout or rheumatism, allegedly. To find the right birch trees, you have to look at the vegetation around and see what herbs and plants are growing there. Then you know if the soil is right. The birch trees have to be young and healthy and vigorous. They have to be thriving. If there are a few promising birch trees in a clamp, then it's worth tapping. Peter Mosten doesn't make medicine from the sap, he makes sparkling wine. They thought I was crazy, an idiot. It wouldn't work. I would fail. But that was only in the beginning. Now it is working, and it's fun, and they trust me. Drilling holes into birch trees to produce an alcoholic beverage? At first, Peter's idea received little enthusiasm in the Östersund community who own the trees. Normally I use 250 birch trees. This year I double my production and need about 500 to 600. That generates about 10 to 15 liters of sap a day per birch. So I aim to tap around 50,000 liters. He nagged those responsible in the community until they finally gave their okay. And the first of many hurdles had been cleared. Birch sap as a drink is particularly well known in the rural regions of Eastern Europe. Nobody had successfully produced a sparkling wine from the sap until Peter Mosten found a recipe. His curiosity was aroused when he was tidying the writings left by a Swedish chemist. Whilst he was doing this, he came upon an ancient paper. One of these recipes was from 1785. How to make birch sap champagne. I kept the recipe and tested it for the first time in 1989. It tasted dreadful, really nasty. But Peter, a trained environmental engineer and nutritional chemist, was now keen on the challenge. So he began to experiment. His wife was thrilled. 
When I started to work, even at weekends and at night, and the bottles were exploding in the kitchen, in the laundry room, in the garage, then she started getting ever more annoyed. We nearly split up. She said, either that goes or I go. That's when I knew I had to find a new place for my bottles. Today, bottle after bottle is filled and corked automatically at a former military base, where it doesn't matter if something explodes occasionally. Now enthusiasts from as far afield as Germany, France, Japan or China appreciate the taste of Sav, the birch sap. It was a long journey and nobody wanted to accompany me. Banks, friends, advisors, my family, my wife, everyone was against it. I wanted to show them all that it works. It had to work. I think it was a success. That interest is high everywhere in all countries. It's a unique, original product that only I produce in the whole world.